I was telling them this morning, is that a little echoey? Okay. We had a really good Bible study this morning at St. Matt's and it was, you know, I just, my heart was broken, you know, because when, you know, people have this mindset that because they're at St. Matt's or whatever, that they're a little bit less than everybody else. And I had to remind them that I myself was sitting out there in a seat just like that 30 years ago in a shelter in Leesburg. And, um, and you know, that and I tell them, you know, I pick up people in Port Royal all the time and they're millionaires and they deal with the same carnal flesh old man that everybody deals with. You know, I'm picking them up because they have no license because they're addicted to wine. You know, we're all in the same boat, aren't we? We all are born into this world, into sin, trapped, enslaved to sin, and we got to get out. And so it's the same message to whether I'm at St. Matt's this morning or if I'm here. We're all in the flesh. We all have to deal with the old man. And this is what we started on a couple weeks ago, maybe several weeks ago. I was sick all the one week, and I'm sorry I missed, but pastor had an amazing message. I watched it online and about the, uh, about the weekend we had. Uh, but I started this message out because, you know, I see identity as probably one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ today. Who can say amen? When a young believer, new believer, brand new believer got born again yesterday, they need to know when you look in the mirror now, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We got to stop looking in the mirror. We got to stop walking around and, oh, um, I'm still a poor old sinner. Well, we're going to read Romans 6 and see what Paul says about that. We're going to continue there. But the thing that spurned this was I had mentioned some quotes from atheists. Who was here for that? Anybody? A couple people. You know, and it made me think of the verse um, Ezekiel 36, 20. If you want to bring that up for me, ESV. Ezekiel 36, 20. Because the church <clears throat> today, not just in America, but I think the world, is in need of a revival Right, Not a revival necessarily where I mean where we're running around and jumping up and down and do, doing all kinds of crazy things, you know, in the soul realm there. But we really need to come to a place where we have a revival in knowledge and truth because, uh, you know, the, the word says that my people perish for a lack of something. What is that? Knowledge. Knowledge. You know, Christians remain in bondage to sin for lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of the scriptures. So the past 30 years for me have been, of course, working this into my own life because how can I stand up here and portray this to you as we're going to see in Romans 2, uh, verse 24. We're going to see that we've all got to Look inside. Paul said to test yourselves, prove yourselves, see if you're in the faith. Look inside. But this verse here in um, Ezekiel 36, 20, it says, but, but when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that people said of them, 
These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of this land. God had to drive them out of the land. Um, and Romans 2.17 reiterates that. It, it's, it also says it in, um, oh, where is that at? Isaiah 52.5. Let's pull that one up too while we got it because it's reiterating the same thing. Another prophet reiterating basically the same thing. Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 52, verse 5. It basically says the same thing. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Give me one second. Um, let me make sure that's right. Uh, here we go. Whoops. I'm sorry. Yeah. Isaiah 52.5. Oh, that's Jeremiah. Isaiah 52.5. Okay. Okay. No problem. Well, let me run over there real quick. Isaiah 52.5. Just take me a second here. Um... Okay. Isaiah 52, verse 5 says, Now therefore, what have I here? Declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and, de and continually all the day my name is despised. So there seems to be a habit of the people of God blaspheming the name of God by the way they live. And going back to the atheist website that I had talked about, the way the world is looking at the, 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 the one thing that should be the salt and the light of the world, they're looking at it and saying, they're laughing. What I found. Excuse me. They're looking at it, and, and, and it's a laughing stock. I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching these videos and actually responding to a lot of them, you know, because it's just, it grieves my heart that, that, that the church is in this place. And I'm not saying that this church is. We're not preaching this message here. But the people that are here, I like what Pastor Andrew said. This is the remnant. On Wednesday night, if you're here, you're here because... And this is for a reason. You love the Lord. You want to hear his word preached. And that's a good thing. So going back over to, uh, if you can pull it up, Romans 2, verse, we'll start at 17. And the 17 to 20. Four. I don't know if you can put all that up. I'm just going to breeze through it. But um, the context is Paul is talking about the Jews and how they relied on the law and they boasted in God and know his will and they approve what is excellent because they're instructed out of the law. And if you're sure that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of foolish, a teacher of children, having the law, embodiment of knowledge and truth. Now, I'm, I'm transferring this over to the church. Let's just say instead of the Jews, let's just say the church because this is what's going on. Same thing, the same spirit. These spirits, you know, continue on. They're, 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 they're infiltrating the church again, and the church needs to know how to uh, cast these things out, casting down these things. But here we are, while you preach against stealing, he's saying, do you steal? Um, you know, playing the hypocrite. And that's what the church is called by many people who I talk to. I've, you know, told you I do a lot of ministering on the streets. And that's one of the main things you hear is, well, they're just hypo you're hypocrites. And I can't say that they're wrong because a lot of Christians are hypocrites. But 
this is going to change. God is going to bring a revival. And not, like I said, not a revival of, you know, running around and barking like dogs. He's going to bring a revival of knowledge so that the Christian can begin to walk in his identity. And in doing that, when you're walking in your identity, I promise you, when you know who you are and you believe who God says you are and you confess in the mirror every day who God says you are, you will be transformed into that image. What you behold, you're transformed into. If we behold the glory of the Lord, it says we're, tra we're changed into the same what? Image from glory to glory. And so we're not looking... What we're going to see here soon, we're not going to be looking at our old man. So here we got hypocrites in the church, truly. You who say you don't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. And here he is quoting Isaiah 52 and uh, Ezekiel 36. For it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, 2,000 years later, what are we saying? I want to really help. I wish, I wish a million people would watch this online, not because of me or the tree of life or anything else, but the fact that the church needs to hear the knowledge of who she is and stop professing these lies over her life, over your life. And so that's where we started. We started with the reason why I believe that identity is probably the most important thing. Not only that, but, you know, how many years I spent in recovery ministry and I watched the fruit of this belief system begin to take root in men in discipleship, at St. Matt's, when people begin to believe this, they start acting on it. And I promise you, once you get this in you, and this is starting to work in you, you will begin to become more holy and pure and on fire by accident than you ever did on purpose. Striving according to the law, striving according to the old, the old system, the old man that's always trying to, you know, trying to put cologne on a dead, rotting corpse. We're trying to put a Band-Aid on Adam. So now we're going to go over to Romans 6 and continue from there. Because this is, to me, this is the meat and potatoes of Paul's teaching on the new man and the identity of the new man. So Romans, let's go over a couple chapters here. I'll be in... Um, the ESV, but I am going to switch to and, and read a little bit in the, in the Passion Translation too. Um, we did verse 3, we did, we did verse 3 through 6, um, but just to say again for those who wasn't here, it says in verse 6, we know that our old man, well, no, let's start in verse 1, stay, 1 through 6, Pastor. We'll just do it. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, I believe he said that because in the previous chapters, he's explaining the grace of God and how easy it is to be justified compared to the heavy, laborious law, right? And it's easy to think, well, I got the grace of God. I'm just going to... I'm just going to cruise through life. Yeah, I'm sinning, but God loves me. Well, you're missing a big part of what God wants. You're missing a huge, massive, monstrous part of what God wants to do in conforming you to his image. Huh? Thank you. So what do we do then? Do we persist in sin that God's kindness and grace will increase? What a terrible thought one of the most emphatic negative statements in the Greek language. We have died to sin once for all, as a dead man passes away from this life. 
So how could we live under sin's rule a moment longer? Why is that? Boy, we're going to, we're going to, this is so good. Or have you forgotten that all of us were immersed in the union with Jesus, the anointed one? I believe in most translations it says baptized, which is a Greek word that means fully immersed. It comes from a term where you take dye and you baptize it in the color ink you want. You got to get that whole thing in there for all of it to get the color you want. And it's immersed. We've been immersed in the union with his death. This is where we are currently, presently, forever. We're in union. Our old man is in union with his death. And when did it start? The day you started praying real good? No, it's the day you trusted Jesus Christ. You were born from above. Born again is probably, not, I don't know why they put that in there, but it literally means you're born from above. You're born from a higher place. You're born from an ascended place. You're born from the realm of God. You're born of his seed. It's in you. You're immersed. Sharing in his death, verse 4, by our baptism, immersion, means that we were co-buried and entombed with him so that when the Father's glory raised Christ from the dead, we were also raised with him. We have been co-resurrected with him so that we could be empowered to walk in the freshness of new life. Mm, what a great and precious promise. Man, if we started to believe this, the changes that would happen in the church worldwide, we would become the salt and the life. We would begin to recognize who we are, who we were, who we are now. Co-buried, in tuned with him so that when the Father's glory raised Christ from the dead, we were also raised with him. So here we're going to talk about the new man. We have been co-resurrected with him. When Jesus was resurrected, we were in him before the foundation of the world. We, you and I were in him. There is no time and space in the presence of God. It's all the eternal now. We were with him then. We were buried with him then. We were resurrected with him then. And then 2,000 years later, you were born, you get saved, and it's already something God foreknew. To those he foreknew, Romans 8, 29, he predestined to be conformed to his image. He foreknew all this stuff, guys. For since, verse 5, for since we are permanently grafted into him. I love that word. We're permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his. Then we are permanently grafted into him to experience a resurrection like his and the new life that it imparts. Verse 6, my favorite. I love the way he says it. Could it be any clearer that our former identity now, if you look in, in, in my notes, it says in the Aramaic, that's the Adamic man in, this, in, in, in the Aramaic. The, 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 the old man, that's the old man that we inherited from Adam. That man, that old man, our former identity of that old man is now and what? Forever ever deprived of its power. So that way, when you feel like that, you, you know, you say, well, the flesh was rising up. If you feel like the flesh is rising up, you say, no, that power, will, and you just confess it to yourself. You may not feel, how many times you, you know, you don't feel like God is, you know, giving you the, the Holy Ghost zingers. And we don't walk by that. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't walk by what we feel. We're not, you know, when the Spirit comes on you and you just, you're so overwhelmed and you start dancing for real in the Spirit, that's real. 
I am not negating that at all. But there is a lot of stuff that in the church today that is uh, manufactured, solical, right, Jay? Solical, emotional things that's not begun in the spirit. It's begun in the flesh. You know, we can, you know, a good, a good, um, a good uh, what's his name? Something Robinson, the positive speaker or whatever. You know, they can, Tony Robbins, they can work you up. Preachers can work you up in the flesh. But if it's not something that's taken part in the spirit, it's just vanity. Amen. For we were co-crucified with him. We know that our old self, let me, uh, let me just continue to read this in the Passion. Um, our former identity is now forever deprived of his power. For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle, to take apart, to throw down the stronghold of sin within us. It is so powerful what you believe. Belief is, 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 is everything. When the disciples said, Lord, what must we do to work the works of God? What was Jesus' answer? You got to do this, do that. Journey to the temple once a year, do this, do that, do this, do that. He said, believe on him who he has sent. Boy, do you know how much workload that takes off of you? No more striving to perform. It's called the Shabbat. It's called the rest of God. Hebrews talks about that we enter into his rest where we cease from our own works as God did from his. That's the rest of God. Now, I talk about this all the time at St. Matt's because people are always under the mentality that we've got to wake up and do for God. We got to get that out of our mind and, and, and get the, what is it, the, the, the horse before the cart? What is that? You got to get the foundation right and then everything else is going to follow along. Lay the foundation first. The foundation, I'm telling you, is every single one in here knowing who you are and not just knowing it up here. It's got to travel 14 inches from up here to down here into your heart. So when I tell the guys at St. Matt's, listen, God loves you just as much on your bad day as he does on your good day. But I am telling you, as you grow and mature, and man, there's so much good stuff to talk about. The discipleship, the growing and maturing from a child to a huyos, right? A son, where we begin to really inherit the promises. It takes growth, it takes time, it takes practice. But if we lay the foundation and get that knowledge and understanding, it's going to change everything. So it, dis it, it dismantles the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to one moment longer submit to sin's power. Oh, there's so many places I wanted to go here, but I wanted to try to keep it confined, you know. But we could really, I want to really get into this next week, I think, where we talk about Hebrews is an incredible theological book. It's a very Hebraic, Jewish type of book. I think Paul wrote it personally. It's got a signature at the end you know, where he says, I sign all of my epistles this way. But it would seem like Paul would understand the, all the deep things 
of sacrifices, the blood, the atonement, all these different things and how they work because it was always meant, the blood in the Old Testament was meant to remove the consciousness of sins, but it, could, it didn't work because there's always a blood sacrifice year after year for reminder of sins. But in the New Covenant, we have something so far greater than the blood of an animal. We have the blood of the Son of God, God in the flesh, who had blood in his veins and willingly shed it all. I mean all. Read the historical doctors and stuff like that who read the, 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 the story of the crucifixion. There was no blood left in him. He poured it all out. And that blood is able to remove from us that consciousness of sin so that every day we wake up. When I wake up and my feet hit the floor, Debbie's laughing. She knows why. She's seeing me. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting the day started right. Father, I'm forgetting the things which are behind. I'm pressing forward to the things which are before. Lord, whatever failures I had yesterday, thank you, Lord, that you forgive me and your grace is covering me. And I, I promise, Lord, if you walk with me today and you infuse your spirit in me, I promise, like Philippians 2.5 says, it will be you working in me both to will and and to do. Man, God's going to give you the will to do it. Look at, look at the ministry of Paul. That, Paul said everything that he had did, that whole list, and he's talking about beatings and going through just, I mean, crazy stuff. And he says it's all by the grace of God. I, I did it all by the grace of God. It was God working in me to will and to do all this. You imagine what God would will and to do within all of us if we really woke up and put our feet on the floor and dedicated the whole day to the Lord. Amen. And we didn't focus on sin, we focused on the Son, and we focused on our identity. Amen. And any time a thought comes into your mind, you've got to be ready to cast it down. And then not just cast it down, you need to hide all this word in here so that you can start like Jesus did in the wilderness. No, devil, no, Satan. The Bible says that my former identity has been deprived of its power. It's gone. Get out of here. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help me walk in you right now, Father. That's the way my life is every day. And it's had a great effect on me. I know it works. And I have become more like him on accident than I ever did on purpose. And I'm not saying I don't strive or, or try or anything. I'm not saying that. But, you know, if I'm sitting there and God tells me to do something in faith, I say, usually I say, is that you, Lord, or is that me? But I step out in faith, and I do it. And next thing I know, you know, he tells me to go. One time he told me to go stand at a bus stop one time. I had to walk or took, took my skateboard down there, a remote bus stop. I didn't even know it was there in Clearwater. Well, Indian Rocks. And I got to the bus stop. I'm like, I'm here, Lord. Steps of faith. Hallelujah. And I'm just reading my Bible and just fellowshipping with him. And it's all good. And all of a sudden, I get on the bus, and there's this guy. Smelled a little. A lot. And I can remember in my mind thinking, okay, we're going to sit over here. And God said, mm -mm, you sit over there, sir. I said, okay, Lord. Sat down. Ended up this guy had lost his whole family in a motorcycle accident heading to Daytona about a year or two ago. Had a house, had a family, had a car, had a normal life like us. Lost the most precious thing in his, in his, in his life, his family. And he just lost hope. And there he was on the bus with me. <laughs> I knew I was there for a purpose. When, I, when this started to happen, I'm like, Lord, you're so good. He knows. And by the time we got off the bus in Clearwater, he was calling me an angel from God. 
Because in reality, an angel is just an, an angel. It's just a messenger. Could be a human. Could be a divine. It could, you know, there's many messengers in the Bible that were human. That day, I can say that I was a messenger because I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, at the house just, you know, Lord, what are we doing today? I'm going to go wash the car today. Nope, you're going out of the bus stop. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. What is that? <sighs> the walk of faith. This is, this is the effects, guys, of knowing your identity. You will wake up every day with a pep in your step. You're going to be sun conscious, not sin conscious. And I'm saying, even if you wake up and say, it, it, it sounds good, but I'm not going to, Lord, I'm not going to sin against you today. You've already failed because now your mind's on you and your sin and I'm not going to do it. Psh, who are you kidding? In and of ourselves, we can do nothing. Unless we abide in that vine every day, drawing and sapping that life from the word of God, the spirit of God, animating our spirit, which in turn animates our soul, which in turn animates this body, we're just going to be of men most miserable. We're going to be miserable. Walking in the flesh, doing our thing, living our lives in what we think is best, building programs for the church. Man, what would a program be like that God burns in the hearts of one of you and it's just, you know it's God and you go to Pat and say, hey, I want to do this. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're a hand, a foot, a toe, an ear, an eye. <sighs> wow. Let's get down to my end here. Let's, so much. I need two hours, but. Let's just, let's just close it out here. So we're not going to continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. And I got here, does it sound impossible? Yes. This is impossible with men. It is impossible if you're still dominated and believing that an old nature still drives you. It is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Sometimes in my prayers in the mornings, I say, Lord, let's go and, and let's make history. What can I do? Maybe it'll be at Walmart. I get on, you know, I'm just, who knows? I've got 30 people around me talking sharing the gospel. I, I don't know. Let's make history. Let's do something. Let's walk in the spirit. Let's not walk in the flesh. And walking in the flesh is walking in, with the confession that your old man still is there and still, you know, wants to, to crush you and keep you down and We've got to remove this from our minds. We've got to begin to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a discipleship. That's, that's going, we're going to get into discipleship, Lord willing, on, on the things that we do, not to be right with God, but because we are right with God. See, we get to study the Bible now. I get to wake up every day and say, Lord, this is not my life. I'm no longer my own. I'm bought with a price. That's the way I live. I don't do it perfectly. Let me just make sure I put that out there. But I'm telling you, as the years go on, as the months go on, because I wake up every day and I'm take an inventory of, you know, Father, is there anything today that you want me to do, that you want me to learn? Just always mindful. Because he that keeps his mind stayed on him is kept in what? Perfect peace. Perfect peace. In the Hebrew, that's salom, salom. Peace, peace. And that is the peace that passes all understanding. That is why I am jacked up 24-7, and as Debbie will tell you, there's no off button. 
Do you, do you want to have that? Once we get through this old man, new man thing, we're going to get into just practical discipleship, things that we do every day to get into good, godly, healthy habits, not because we want to attain righteousness, but because we are. And now you know you are. Now we can start climbing, ascending up the hill of God. Once we got them clean hands and a pure heart by faith and trust in his work and not mine, we're going to start walking up this mountain. We're going to ascend the mountain. We'll talk about ascending the mountain of God. This stuff gets really good. The Old Testament is where Paul and the apostles got all their revelation about the new. And then you read the new and you see all these things. It's like, wow. Is this good stuff? Is anybody being edified? That was my prayer today. I get up here and I'm telling you, I stand up here sometimes and this is, I'm standing before God. I'm standing before an audience of one. And you are his, <laughs> not mine, not mine. And he wants to do a work in you that the world won't even believe. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for this word. Father, we believe with all of our hearts and all of our minds that you are able to complete this work in us. You are able to finish what you started. And you have started with everyone in here a work. And wherever they are, Father, let them rest. But at the same time, let them wake up and not be satisfied until they awaken in your likeness. Love them like you love. Have joy like you had. Well, the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. Love, joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your long-suffering. You're everything that you are, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, your self-control, all that, let us not be settled until those things abound in us and the world's going to see and they're going to point their fingers now and say, I want what they got. In Jesus' name, amen.